Hi, this is Dr. Scott Young, and for hearing solution experts, as well as the drscottyoung.com um, area. So I have two different channels. I'm gonna put this on both channels because I believe that it's relevant to both sides, okay? I wanna tell you where this kind of comes from. The, the concept that we're gonna talk about today is ethics and morals. Uh, this is so misunderstood, it's not even funny. But let me tell you the start of this, this concept in the field of audiology, just like it is in every other business realm. So the state of Oklahoma decided by <coughs> proxy, by committee, by an ethic to create um, a concept that every audiologist in the state of Oklahoma had to spend, I think it was an hour, I could be wrong on that exact number, but uh, I think it was an hour of ethics. Now, normally, um, audiologists in the state of Oklahoma have to do 12 hours of CEUs per year, um, 10 to 12 hours, something like that. Um, and, and it's very common throughout the industry, or excuse me, throughout the industry, and yeah, even throughout the states, that they would require CEUs. Now, you can't just like have some random thing on online that you're, you're doing. It needs to be within your field or at least some realm of that. When the first uh, conversation of ethics, where could you get them? Because you could find that in a whole bunch of different areas. They were really specific. <clears throat> you had to preload the information um, it, and, and it had to be approved. And you're like, wait, wait a second. If I'm going to go to a conference um, or I'm going to watch something online, and you know, <clears throat> spend the hour upon that that particular topic. What comes out is that first off, I, you know, this could be today is uh, September twentieth, and let's just say that that particular event is October fifteenth. Um, I, I mean, I have a maybe a barely a concealed understanding, a paragraph of what that might be, but I don't have it pre-approved. And, and they would say, well, unless you go to it and have it basically pre-approved, which is the only way you could get it pre-approved, is to know all the details of it. And it was like, okay, I don't get it. Um, and, and basically what the state of Oklahoma is trying to push is for you to come to, to theirs. Now, they've opened it up a little bit more because there was probably a lot of complaints. The very first one was done down in Oklahoma City. So I'm driving from Tulsa to Oklahoma City, and I'm frustrated because I'm having to spend half a day, you know, out of the clinic, you know, to deal with this, this one case where I could have done it within another conference that I was going to or other ways. Fine. So I'm there, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm asking myself like, wait a second, if I don't have any morals, will I really have any ethics or I'm just falling along because I have to in that way. So what? really are you infusing ethics within me this came up again and i mean i i was complaining about that right and um excuse me a little bit stuffed up here um and my staff i mean i was being a little bit loud you know with my staff around me i saw a guy that i know very well and many of you in the field know who he is and he is a great speaker and he comes in the room and he is not but three, four rows. And this is a big old nasty uh, 450 auditorium. He's not three or four rows behind me. And he literally says the same thing. Now, I know he has the same basic philosophical nature that I have. And we were saying, listen, if you don't have a moral basis, like if you have a psychopath, can you really infuse um, ethics within them? Now, how do you know a psychopath? Many of us couldn't recognize them or wouldn't even know that they exist. They're so good at covering up their situation. And, and so, I mean, there are psychopaths and power players who have no um, morals, but they're defining the ethics. And this came out more recently when we were, we were doing an ethics course online with a hearing aid manufacturer, um, not to be named. And, and, and the person was being nice. I mean, and, but, it, but she was reading from the screen, which bored the snot out of me, but secondarily, she barely understood what she was talking about. 
And and when you when you look up the words of morals and 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 um, ethics, you get a lot of messy stuff in here. So we're going to talk a little bit about this. We're going to talk about this what what it kind of means in professional practices. But we're also going to talk about it more from a general kind of uh, general statement because I, I'm seeing so much silliness in the world, and we've been seeing that ever since 2020. So many crazy things that you're going, wait a second, that just doesn't mix with an overall society with that. And so you have a small group of people pushing out an agenda, whatever that might be, that doesn't even match the the the, the public domain. And and you're going, I'm not down with that particular thing. So I want to get into this a little bit more because most people have no clue what, what morals mean or ethics mean, and they interchange the words all the time, and including the people who teach this these particular type of courses. So that's my background of, of that statement. And listen, I've spent years defining these kinds of things in my own apologetics kind of thing, in my own business, and writing policies. And what you have to understand is ethics are just part of policies of a smaller group, whereas morals have a more globalized or a larger sense group. So let's get into this. And, you know, when you see these words of integrity, business, right, definition, values, you know, principles, and you're like, I don't even know how to how to put them. And then you read online and you think that you've got it down. And the answer is you haven't got it. Um, and because because there's so much obfuscation all the way through and through in this stuff. But let me throw out a couple ideas to you. Morals tend to be, and I'm not gonna all I'm and I'm not trying to push one religional type, but you know, morals are God's codes for a basis of man's interpretation of wrongs and rights. Okay. Now evil is a profound immoral or malevolent or wicked act. So sometimes we we pull in that evil card and whip it out and throw it at someone. And I'm like, wait a second. You were talking about what my ethics were. Now, ethics are man's codes for wrongdoings that we might do. Now, that's a very heavy uh, generalization. And we'll we'll break these. Some people like, you know, float from evil to ethics to morals and evil ethic and morals. And then it becomes up in the political sphere. And by the way, do you know that most of the, uh, here's the funny thing that most people don't realize, the three letter agencies are underneath the executive branch. And many times the executive branch of our government, of our federal government, tells the legislative branch what to do. They tell the congressional or the house branch what to do. And the, and the House is supposed to create the laws and and then the president or the governor, and this is the same kind of thing <clears throat> that happens in a state thing. So in Arizona or whatever, you've got a state house and Senate that will that will confirm it. Two different bodies um, that, that will look at that law and they will adjust it as they go through and they're democratically rising that thing up. It sends up to that governor or in essence, the federal thing to a president. But here's the other thing, the legislative body gets to interpret that and can smack it down and say, no way, it doesn't even fit, right? So those are what's called laws. Now they still have to be defined within what we would call morals, ethics, Aren't even, aren't even on the realm of legal issues or moral areas with that too. Let me give you an example. Moral areas are murder. Someone murders someone. But, but, we, but see, some people then expand murder, and you hear this by lawyers all the time. They obfuscate with this. Well, he murdered him. Well, can I give you an example of, of that? I used to say to my patients years and years ago that when a cricket comes in the door and you hear this, you know, that little, little annoying sound, go smash it, right? And I mean, I got with this one woman who's just out of bounds, like freaked out on me, you know, smash the cricket. And I mean, she was so, I mean, offended in that way. 
And then I finally, like, I changed the wording when I was talking about a fitting of a hearing aid because you could hear that kind of sound. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, you just, you know, shove it out the, out the back door. She was like, oh, okay, that's fine. Um, with that too. And, and yet, because what she was doing is rising the conversation of, of smashing a cricket to murder. Now, that's a hyperbole. That's an out-of-bounds kind of, of conversation that some people want to go with. But we see this in small groups, in these small uh, lobbyist types of groups, and, and they come through as power players. And, and they, whether you agree with them or not, um, they'll come through and they will push agendas and they will change the legal or the moral kind of codes on that kind of stuff. And, and yet the body, uh, when we call it the body politic, which is actually the group, for instance, in America, they're going, hey, wait a second. That doesn't fit with anything. And it becomes a conversation of unfairness. And so that we have no clue what the difference between philosophy, ethics, morals, business, right, definition, abstract kind of things. Uh, you know, I mean, goals, I mean, like we have no idea what that is. It's my opening salvo on this thing. What the flock are morals? A moral is a truth. It is not something that is fungible, that is adjustable over time with that too. So some believe morality is a person or society's idea of what's right and wrong. Now, what the problem with that particular concept is, is that if a society suddenly disagrees with that, let me give you an example. Go backward in time to World War I. The Germans, under the Wehrmacht, went off and created what was so out of bounds for anyone because normally wars were called like the Boer Wars or they were called, you know, based upon a nation. Um, like, for instance, before World War II, there was, a, there was a war between Russia and Japan and they fought against each other. So you could think of it those ways. But when you had World War I, it changed the rules because then they had this globalized war messed with everyone. The, um, the last thing is <clears throat> the, the peace treaty. Now that peace treaty comes out and it's, uh, it, it is very difficult for Germany to handle the peace treaty because it put all of the onus for payment through Germany and dropped them into an absolute, and in those embers where they couldn't pay the, pay the bill. And in those embers rose up something called Nazi or a, a very ugly fascist regi regime. And so in the 30s, there was a big vying between these groups. And so the Nazi ideal comes up and that's where we get our, uh, some of our more modern understanding of really an evil. Now that's, that, that sucker comes on from around the 30s all the way through late 40, excuse me, 45. And, and so we have this ideal of 60, 70 million people who die in a war. And, and yet what they did is they were changing the rules, specifically the laws. The first people that they did away with were those who were, who were critically infirmed, meaning people who were older. So they started kind of coming up with a date range of, of someone who was a drain on society or the mentally impaired. And they just said, well, let's just put them in the gas camps and kill them. And, and so they, they expanded and expanded and they were changing the morality. <clears throat> That's why you can't have a society's a, a ability to, under, to talk about right and wrong, because then what you have is a small clique that will change the laws that are fundamentally abhorrent to that, to the whole. Others stipulate that it's an idea or an opinion driven by the desire to do good. Now, we see this today from 2020-24. There is a, this massive chasm between groups of people who go, well, that guy is a moral evil. And this woman is a moral evil. And, and back and forth with this kind of thing. And, and you're going, well, and, and here's the point. It's an idea. It's an opinion. In the Greek 
uh, wording, because if, if you go into a Greek wording, it's really interesting. Opinion actually is closer to lie than it is a veritas statement. Veritas is the is one of the Greek words for truth. There's a whole bunch of them, right? And veritas actually comes, it, it, it has a scientific nature. So for instance, if I have a theorem and I'm going to verify that theorem by placing, you know, a, the chemicals through the, the, the test and we come out with an answer, right? That's how it works. But when we have opinion, well, Scott's opinion of what the desire to be good could be like totally psychotic, right? Versus another person's opinion. And then it becomes like this, oh, well, we just have no idea. And yet that's what people think morals are. Real morals come from outside of oneself. They're not fungible, which means changeable. In reality, this has been going on for a very long time, literally hundreds of years, that we've been fighting with this, which causes these crazy and unbelievable wars. Because we don't even have an understanding of what morals are outside of yourself. Because then Scott can make up all the rules, and then Judy's sitting over there going, hey, that's not, that's not, that's not a good rule. And then if she's elected to office, in essence, she gets to make all the rules. And, and, and that's what we call democracy. And, and yet, because someone does it democratically does not mean that it's a now, we have to follow that particular law or moral. In America, we have this thing called the Constitution. And so we fulfill it by the Constitution. And so we have an outside of the box conversation that actually is the controller that we need to filter the, the court systems, the, you know, the Congress, the Senate, the presidents, and all the other whatevers, including the people, through that one filter called the Constitution. Other nations call it common law. And, 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 and it does come from, I'm going to tell you the truth, it comes from biblical kind of nature with that too. And that might be offensive to you, but it is where those things come from. So in history, we've been persuaded by those moralities. And, and, and we, they're not vague. They would tell you what is murder with that too. And it actually kind of hits into the heart of, of, the, of the person with that too. And that's why, you know, you have this, this really fundamental, um, like disdain with morals. And so they have to like, uh, they have to dress them down in essence. Okay. Instead of the suit and tie, they have to like, you know, uh, reduce that nature of that. Okay. Now, righteousness, this is going to be, and I'm not trying to be biblical here. <clears throat> I'm just telling you what righteousness actually means in this. And, and see, because it actually defines some of the laws and the morals with it too. Righteousness actually means, in the Greek terminology, equity. That I would have equity with another person. That brings me in that, in, into a balance of that. It means to be completely justified. And when we go to court, we want to be justified. We want to find the just answer to that. Did that dude do that crime? Completely justified, right? We're not just talking about fairness, which we'll kind of have a conversation about in a second. It needs to have purity in there, right? I mean, it, it needs to be more than just equity and justified, but we want to have some level of purity. We have a small group um, of people. This is happening in our governments in the last, the last several years, and we're going, Wait a second, that doesn't even fit to it. You, small group, are telling the large group what we should do, and you're not even following, you know, those common laws, for instance. Now, our righteousness, I would, I would, it's activated by faith. And faith is, faith is, don't get too sideways on, you know, the Christianity of that. But faith is actually, is, is operated on by every single business owner in the history of the world. Do you know what business owners do? They put an ad out in a newspaper <clears throat> in a, on an online thing or a whatever source. And, and so they do their marketing and all that is, is based upon faith. They have faith that they have a good enough message that the people will actually respond to them 
in a positive manner and come in and purchase or do whatever they're looking for that person to do. Like, right, so we have we have faith, for instance, the iPhone just came out with the iPhone or the uh, um, iOS 18. You have some level of faith that if you plug it into, you now this is an iPhone 12, and if I plug it in my iOS 18 into the 12, that it would actually run. That's called faith too. And it's gotta have a level of, wait a second, is it justified? And by the way, Apple and all these other companies are doing these these really ugly things that you know that they they have um, levels of oh well that's not a good enough phone anymore right and so you have to upgrade the phone and they have this planned obsolescence that really doesn't have any equity it doesn't have any justification for it it's just they want to make money and that is that's a difficult thing when we look at that now ethics are a little bit farther down the line. Now, they are business decisions. <clears throat> they are, in essence, policy procedure manuals of a small group of people. What they come from, in essence, is this. They're rendered by a group of, of individuals who wish, and, and they're, they're, they're brought on, and they're, because that small group of people are saying, okay, you plumbers, make up a, a group, you plumbers will do certain levels of things. Now, we're not talking about whether they wear their pants correctly, <laughs> okay? We're not talking about that they have their, you know, their cutoff shirt in the right way, but that they wouldn't walk onto a job, you know, spitting on, on the person's carpet. So there's an ethic that might happen in there. There's, there's some basic rules that have, have a rights within that group, okay? Another way of looking at this, this is a body of rules drawn from an authoritative peer group. There are registrations of regulations. So if you violated those particular things, and <clears throat> there's a conversation called HIPAA, a privacy act that you wouldn't share your information with someone else when I didn't want you to do that. If I'm the, the patient coming into that, that, um, that care provider of any type, then I don't want you to go share that information online with everyone and show how, how, how stupid Scott was or whatever that might be. And that's, that's, what, that's where that kind of thing comes from. Those are ethics. Ethics are guiding philosophies of the behavior of the group. So for instance, when we talk about the behaviors, it, it defines those behaviors. And if you're kicked out of that group, then you have no longer have the registration to be able to be in that group. Does that make sense? So then what happens is that there is a, a, you know, there, there would be a governing body over it and saying, listen, um, we need to look at that. Now I'm going to, I'm going to address a couple parts in that a little bit later when we go to the summary here. Okay. Now let's do the next phase. So <clears throat> ethics will sometimes go in good ethics. will go in and look at the laws and say, you know what? We can apply, we're applying the, the specific nature of that particular law that we see out there, and we're pulling it into our group of plumbers, our group of audiologists, and, and kind of having a backing with that too. So then if you violate that ethic, you could actually be referred to a real authorities beyond, you know, beyond just being kicked out. I mean, you could actually... Um, you know, go through criminal things. Let me let me give you an example of that. There are, and, and I don't want to get into the <clears throat> specifics, but there was a physician who was treating a whole bunch of of young girls um, through the USA uh, Olympics, or the Olympics committees, right? And um, you know, they were you know, th these young girls are you know incredibly limber, incredibly powerful, you know, young dynamos. You normally have a very short kind of person, and and so the girls got. I mean, if you look at the power that they actually accomplish, it's they're world class athletes, right? But they can also you know rip tendons and all kinds of other things in crazy spots, including in the groin, for instance, because they're doing splits that I couldn't even possibly do, right? And so this one physician was utilizing very questionable natures to touch in areas on a young girl. And then, you know, then there were sexual issues going on with this. This ethic rose up 
And enough parents were like, wait a second, this can't happen. And by the way, he did it for a very long time. And once he was bounced out of, of the ethic of the Olympic Committee and then into the physician uh, group, then it got referred over to, I think it was the Michigan courts. And the Michigan courts got into it in the middle of that. So now we just moved an ethic out to the legal nature, which violated the moral standards. And then, boo, man, you know, now the guy's in jail for the rest of his life. I don't know the whole story. It doesn't really matter with that too. But you can kind of see a progression that can come from what is an ethical, <coughs> ethical behavior that's violated to illegal to the moral. Okay. And, and we need to have those standards so that we know what we're looking at. Justification is how that we have the weights and balances in there too. We expect our court systems to follow within that thing. So um, it's rendered by one who is just. I mean, if you get a, a court judge up there and he or she are sitting up there and, you know, the, the guy's like, a, a you know, a, a dealing drugs on the side or laundering money over here, that's not someone we need on, on the bench. Kind of thing. That's where it's coming from with that. It's rendered by one who is innocent. So that's why we have to have really high standards for those people. The innocent indicates the idea of righteousness, meaning being having equity with your fellow man with that too, or woman. I'm not, I'm just using a little overall point. And it has a perfect understanding of righteousness. What is that? What does that mean? It means that you can differentiate the differences between it. The word, um, the, the word righteousness actually has, and if it, depends, it depends on the Greek word that you kind of come up with. And by the way, we utilize these words, and you think I'm just talking from Bible stuff, but those words, we've, we've stolen so many words over, over the years in English from Latin and Greek and Spanish and all these other words that, that actually are collapsed and brought in. For instance, Latin actually instructs a lot of the law. And what righteousness does, it actually has something that audiologists think of all the time. It has the ability to discriminate between two different things, two different musical instruments. That's actually one of the basis of righteousness. Now, as a musician myself, and as someone who has near perfect pitch, and I used to have a four and a half octave range. The average octave range is around one and a half octaves a person. I used to have a four octave range. I'm probably down to three, three and a half kind of range because of <clears throat> some other issues going on. But what happens is that I also very discriminating when it comes to pitches. Whereas a, the normal person might listen to someone who's just a little out of pitch and they might go, well, it's okay, you know, but can't really identify it because of the way that that hearing is. But it's how the right brain through the corpus callosum actually um, interprets it. But people who are musicians, I mean, they're over there freaking out, you know, wanting to rip the guitar, wanting to sit the person down and fix that pitch so that it can be correct with that too. And, and that's the basic nature of that righteousness. So that, for instance, in this nature, the judge fully understands the level of the law and can apply it, okay? We're not talking just about the lawyers. We're talking about the judge has to fully understand the law and apply it correctly within the body politic. And so when we have that complete ability to accomplish the righteousness, we then have the law with that too. Okay, so I know some of you are looking at this going crazy. Yeah, but this is how this is how deep we need to be in this, okay? Morals are the basis of this. Morals define a society which are the basis of the laws. I just said that. Righteousness contains the nature of morals so that we know that, hey, man, I, I can go to different places inside of this country, and they're not going to mess with it from Colorado to New Mexico, for instance. Now, there might be a few change. Let me give an example. Um, if you drove in, uh, in, for instance, in Colorado, there are, uh, it, they actually have a little bit lower speed limits in Colorado than they do in Kansas. But if you went to Wyoming, 
you'll see speed limits um, on some of those roads, 85 miles an hour. Um, that doesn't exist in Colorado because they, that's just what they have. So we're not talking about a moral level. We're talking about a regulatory agency that's kind of, you know, giving a level of grace for that particular, you know, place. Ethics should come from morality of the whole in that righteousness so, so that we have an understanding of it. And it's when someone starts to, you know, um, incorrectly define what they do. And I, I had a video I did here of a neighborhood um, who was telling all of their <clears throat> people that lived in the neighborhood that you couldn't park a van and, in, in front of your house um, from particular hours of the night. And so these people had to go like park their van because they were talking about a homeowner's association and they were parking their van and paying a hundred dollars a month to go park outside the neighborhood and they had to walk back home. And you're going, wait a second. What if the guy is a roofer, a fence maker, a plumber, and he's got his, his, his thing. And they were like, well, that's an eyesore. And yet what they did is they violated the, the um, legal rights of the particular homeowners in that place. And so judges were starting to get involved in this. And so there's a lot of conversation that needs to come in here because the homeowner association started to violate the laws and people couldn't tell the difference, okay? Justification comes by the basis of the laws under the morality. <clears throat> so a country's expectation for criminal punishment is very consistent and that needs to happen by the way if we don't have consistency then we don't have the ability to figure this stuff out this is happening in california in a very bad way no matter what you feel no matter what your particular you know democrat republican conservative liberal kind of nature but when you say and there are actual signs in san francisco that says that you can you can um steal up to 950 dollars of, of of, uh, you know, items. Well, what if I got all of my friends together, my 10 friends, and I steal $950 and I keep it within that number and I do it in an orderly fashion? Well, now I just took out $9,500 out of 10 friends out of that facility. And basically I wiped them out. So how are they going to pay for that? And if it keeps happening over and over again, you can't get insurance to cover it. And so then they're leaving left and right because they, they decided that you didn't have to pay. I mean, they couldn't criminalize that particular person for an, um, $500 of steal. For the people who walk in there and they don't ever steal versus the someone who doesn't have a moral, um, internal moral compass, that's a problem, okay? That's why we gotta understand this a little closer. Now I'm gonna hit this very quickly. I'm not gonna get this you know too heavy because we are already probably going, whoa. You know, and many of you need to sit down and look at this, but there are things called natural freedoms. And this actually applies over in those ethics and morality. Natural freedoms are, the, you know, your ability to marry who you wish or live with who you wish or live where you wish, for instance, right? I can live in San Francisco <clears throat> and I can live in Oklahoma City, whatever that might be. And that's a choice that I might make. That's called a natural freedom that someone in a society has. Circumstantial freedom is a freedom to do something without coercion. Scott, you're going to do it this way or I'm gonna kick your butt, basically. That's the kind of idea that we have. And so, you know, now it does change a little bit, you know, depending upon the circumstance. And so we have circumstantial freedom, so we have some level of, of looking at it. Now, the coercion can happen from authorities saying, hey, that is, is a wrong thing to do. Now, we also have a fascinating one <clears throat> called an acquired freedom. That is when an American citizen puts down his or her citizenship, in essence, to go and fight in a war for, again, that body politic. So that is an acquired freedom. That it takes a higher level of morality to say, you know what, I'm gonna lay my life on the line for a country that you know is supposed to represent me. That's a fascinating one. 
And that should be defined inside of morality and ethics with that too. True freedom, though, actually comes from someone who can morally make a choice and can figure out um, through that moral choice and says, you know what, I don't care if I'm violating the ethic because it's violating the moral code. Now, that'll mess with you if you really thought about that one. Now, I'm going to hit this one kind of uh, quickly too. Justice versus fairness. See, people ask this all the time. So is the body or the group fully fair to all people in all situations? Heck no, they're not. They never have been. You're never going to have perfect uh, fairness to every single person. And see, we keep trying to make things change so it's fairness. So for instance, that $950, well, it should be fair because that guy was is homeless and he should be able to get um, um, enough to feed himself or to clothe himself for that night. And going, yeah, but it's not fair for me who actually follows the laws and goes, you know, it's wrong to steal. Does that make sense? But this, we do have to look at that a little bit. And there are times where it isn't always fair. It just never can be. Since the world has never experienced full fairness, we don't have a reference point upon this. If you re really thought about it, you probably have had grace and, and you've had uh, uh, levels of forgiveness in your life or levels of, of, you know, they just didn't catch it. I mean, you've, and let me give an example. You're driving down the road. You, it's supposed to be a 55 mile an hour speed limit and you went 72. You shot through that area. The cop didn't pull you over. In full fairness, they should pull every single person over and give them all tickets in that way. But you haven't had that in every single case. So don't tell me that you have that you always look for fairness in that way. But can someone or something be morally have a morally good reason and yet violate an ethical code? Heck yeah. Because sometimes the ethical code has not looked at the morality of that. Ethical codes can never, ever, ever rise above moral codes. Don't believe it no matter what they say. No, an ethical code might be, you're not going to kill your, your patients you know, in a room. Well, that's, that's a moral and an ethic, okay? But you can't say an ethic goes above a moral code. And we get people who do this all the time which is just like this home ownership, I mean, us um, um, homeowners associations who start getting all picky about where you put your trash can and then start to, you know, give you uh, violations. They'll put, I, mean, I was trying to sell my house in Colorado and they put a lien on my house because the, there was paint chipping along a vent on the top of a house and I had never even looked at it. I couldn't sell my house, but if I looked down the streets, everyone else had little paint chips here and there, but they were going to put a lien on me. I couldn't sell my house unless I painted that. If they did it actually with, with true, you know, equity out there, they'd have made everyone paint their house, including the people who were making up these ethics. Do you see it? This is a fascinating statement. Now I'm paraphrasing C.S. Lewis. We can't see the straight line because we're too dang close to the line. Like when you're driving down a road, there's a, a highway from Pueblo um, and it goes um, uh, westbound and it goes uh, through a, you know, a couple fascinating areas it's called Highway 50, right? And if you looked at that road, you, you know, you, you're kind of driving down it and it looks pretty darn straight. But if you took a satellite view of that thing, you'd see the curvilinear nature of it, okay? That's what C.S. Lewis kind of talking about. And so sometimes we don't actually have great perspective upon things. Now, here's a fascinating person that said this. Frederick Nietzsche said, word for word here, objective moral values have no meaning outside of God. Nietzsche actually was an agnostic. He didn't believe in God. He believed in the death of God meant the destruction of, and he said this, he understood the death of God meant the destruction of meaning and value of life. And yet he was an agno, agno, agnostic. There's the agnostic, excuse me. I said that weird. Um, objective means outside. 
moral value. Okay, so we can't have subjective um, morals. That doesn't make any sense. That's just your personal rule. Like I have a personal rule that you might take off your shoes when you walk into my house. That's not a moral. That's just a, a Scott rule, right? We, can't, we don't want to pull those things to objective morals or values. Because when we start to do that, remember I told you about the Nazi thing here? When we start saying there's no absolute right or wrong, well, then we start working into death camps where anyone can be killed for any reason. Um, while you know of Auschwitz, there are many other death camps that were for political prisoners or for gypsies who were just like they lived in different communities, but they might move around a bit. Actually, most of us in America, and actually most people in the world, are probably more gypsy level than they than they are, you know, planted in that one. You grew up in Denver, you lived all your life in Denver, and you die in Denver kind of thing. And so yet, if we let that kind of thing happen, of, of changing our, you know, there's no absolute right or wrong kind of thing, we get Nazi Germany and killing off 6 million Jews and 5 million undesirables. And it was 11 million. That's the scary part of that. Here's a summary point that I want to kind of say here. Morals are immovable and unchangeable. They're not something you can kind of play with and just oh, tweak it a little bit. Now, laws can be tweaked over time. Laws are derived from the nature of morals so that society might have a compass by which to judge itself and others. Oh my gosh, guys, if we don't have a society that, that has a compass, right? A compass is what you might sit on a ship going, I'm going north. I got it. But if the compass is always spinning around, how would I know where north is? Do you see what I'm saying there? Ethics are made for a small group of people that can contain morality, but they're not morals. And sometimes you need to challenge the ethic of a group. And, and that, that's a big deal. Ethics should never rise to the level of morals. It disqualifies one from a society um, and, and see, they will, they'll go, oh, you're unethical. And then it disqualifies you. And you're going, wait a second, I didn't do anything wrong that anyone else wouldn't do. And see, that was one of the things that I have, I've been having so massive struggles within the COVID kind of craziness. In the Tulsa area, which happened in many other areas, the idiot mayor, J.T. Bynum, said that um, private practices couldn't be open at the time frame. And yet I could go down to Walmart and go get my groceries. Why was Walmart higher in level and called an essential business versus an audiology practice? Explain that one to me. Because what he did is he created a regulation that was not gone through the body politic. We're specifically gone through their, the House Senate, the House um, the, the House Judiciary points all the way to the governor and the governor signed it into law. What they did is they just created an ethic, a policy point. They were putting up and they said you had to like have these little glass, you know, I mean, plasticky things, you know, between your front office and, and the patient up there. It's just kind of crazy stuff. And see, when ethics are raised up to legal kind of level without going through a regulatory agency that is true, you've got just an ethic that has gone off and gone wild. When morals and ethics are both violated, the law can be invoked by the society to punish that individuals. We have to have punishment. If you don't have punishment, it becomes arbitrary. <clears throat> you don't want to have punishment that is resentment toward an individual. The punishment must be a deterrent for individuals to do it. Like if I if I pulled out a gun and started to shoot at someone randomly on a street, then I should be prosecuted, correct? But if someone comes into my house and is trying to harm my wife and my child and everyone else, 
does that is that the same level when I pull out a gun? And see, that's where we get this problem with morals and ethics and their violation of, therein. There must be a grace and a balance there and we, to ethics. Sometimes realizing, oh, that is an ethical violation. That isn't, and, and, and we need to do that with laws. And when we realize that they haven't, those ethics or those laws haven't violated a moral code, then we shouldn't have this um, indiscriminate punishment just by a few people. And that's what we have today. We have that in Congress and Senate and <clears throat> presidency. We have that in, in different states out there that come up with their own way of doing it. And people are going, hey, man, this isn't right. And what they're saying is that it isn't righteous. And when they say righteous, they're saying an equity. It doesn't have equity in there. We're not just talking about fairness. It isn't. It doesn't have any equity. And there's no balance in there. Guys, I know this was a big, nasty topic in here. I don't mean to make it you know, too crazy, but I want you to spend some time upon these. Every single American, and frankly, every single Australian, every single person in Spain needs to a answer these questions. And we need to tell governments, no, you are not violating my moral. And we need to be a part of the solution to governments to tell them you cannot do that because they need to be, they need to fit within the moral structure of that place. And by the way, there are morals that are rise way above their silly ethics and their silly laws. And we need to, you know, knock those down in different ways. So that's really important. And we need to be thinking about that. And that's the level of when ethics, we don't have a clue what we're talking about because ethics are just a policy procedure manual. Hope that helped you out. Thanks so much.